Well, Book TV is on the road. We're in Philadelphia at the University of Pennsylvania, and we're interviewing some professors who also happen to be authors. And we want to introduce you to the dean of the University of Pennsylvania School of Social Policy and Practice. This is Richard Gellis on your screen. And one of his books, his most recent, is called The Third Lie, Why Government Programs Don't Work and a Blueprint for Change. Dr. Gellis, I'm here from the government and I'm here to help you. Is that not true? Not true. Why not? Because most government social programs, which is designed to help people, don't actually help. Um, in some instances, it is little more than the, I hate saying this, but the Do Good or Full Employment Act. It provides lots of jobs for people who'd like to help. But at the end of the day, if you look at whether the needle has been moved and people have really been helped by substantial government programs and substantial amounts of money, the bottom line is very rarely are people helped. Uh, and I thought that uh, that was a story worth telling. Uh, the idea came to me as I was being smuggled into the back door of the State House in the state of Hawaii for a meeting with the Secretary, uh, the Speaker of the House. Uh, Hawaii was spending about a half a billion dollars a year on special education. Um, part of that was subsidized by the federal government under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. The rest was being paid for by the taxpayers of Hawaii. And we had been there for about two years to see whether the half a billion dollars was actually helping special education children. And we had gone through 500 files, and we had discovered almost no help. Uh, lots of services were being provided. Lots of money was being diverted in inappropriate ways. The uh, <clears throat> Commissioner of Education for the state of Hawaii had given a $250,000 grant to someone on the Big Island to run a special education program. Her last job was hula dancer. Uh, that seemed a little bit odd at face value. And it turned out, not surprisingly, she was having a sexual relationship with uh, the commissioner. Um, people were giving thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar grants for horseback riding, and I, I wouldn't have written the book if I thought that was an isolated case. But I had been in the field of social policy for forty years, and I kept seeing this happen again and again and again. And I said, you know, maybe it's time to tell the story that the social programs that people argue about, that they don't want to cut the funding for, uh, that are sacred cows, in fact, do not do a whole lot of good. Head Start, um, I'm sure I made no friends when I started a chapter by saying Head Start is an $8 billion program, it is clearly a sacred cow, nobody wants to cut it, it's never in the debate, and yet all of the positive educational effects of Head Start are gone by the time children get to the third grade. Why is that? Well, it's because the, uh, the Head Start program itself only deals with educational readiness. It doesn't deal with the underlying social problems that affect the kids who are means-tested eligible in Head Start. And, and that was the key. The key to why a lot of these programs don't work is they are targeted program based on some sort of income eligibility or special eligibility and an enormous amount of funding and energy goes into the means testing and eligibility testing leaving very little money uh, for the actual programs and so the programs end up being low dose very minimal and they're not sufficient to change the educational outcomes of children. Just providing them Head Start programs doesn't deal with the fact they're coming from violent homes, violent neighborhoods, poverty, homelessness, food insufficiency. You, you just can't overcome those kind of deficits by providing a Head Start education program. So that's where the book began. And most of the people who advised me said, well, it's a very interesting book. I'm sure you'll get on Fox TV. Uh, and that was not my goal. My goal was not to be a critic. So I said, well, OK, let me do part two of the book, at least to calm people down and say, there are some social programs that are really quite effective. Uh, and maybe we can learn a lesson from that. And the big quiz that, that in the course of writing the book I conducted with 
and, and bored to death my wife and, and my children was, let me sit down with everybody I know and say, tell me the three government programs that have been the most effective in, say, the last 65 years. Almost every one of my academic friends would say, head start, and I would say, wrong. No evidence that it works. The most effective government programs in sort of chronological order, Social Security, the GI Bill of 1944, and Medicare in 1965. Now, there will be some pushback about that. Even USA Today had an editorial this week that said, Social Security is, is a pay-as-you-go program. No, it's not. It can never go broke, provided that you don't take the trust fund and spend it on government debt, which is what we've done for 60 years. But Social Security has all but ended poverty among those over 65. Medicare has all but ended uh, significant health care problems among those over 65. And the GI Bill gets very little credit in 2012 for being the key social policy that built the American middle class. The American middle class was built on two basic components of the GI Bill. Access to education, affordable access to education, which was a voucher program, which meant that the GIs could go to any school they wanted to go to. The money went to them and not the schools. And the second was access to affordable housing. Now, if you roll the clock ahead to 2012, why is the middle class suffering? We don't have access to affordable, high-quality higher education. Our students are taking on vastly too much debt. And my two sons, 38 and 34 years of age, who have good incomes, in one case more than mine, couldn't even buy a house recently because the price of housing exceeds their income. They're in the, in the top 10% of income in the United States. That means housing is no longer accessible to the middle class. And when the middle class can't buy housing, the middle class as we've known it since 1950 ceases to exist. So that's part two of the book. I've got programs that don't work, programs that do work, and then the intellectual challenge, which really took the longest period to get my head around was, okay, if you know that these programs don't work and you've got a good fix on why, and you know these programs do work and you have a good fix on why, are you capable of developing a social program or a blueprint for a program that would work. And that turned out to be quite tricky. Uh, you would like to help children. You would like to deal with social disadvantage of children. And the roadblock turns out that it is simply not in the political cards, whether you're on the left of center, right of center, or right on the center. Our government is not about to help children by directing significant social resources to their parents. So one of the reasons most of our social programs fail is we give so little to the parents that it really doesn't overcome much in the way of social disadvantage. So that stopped me cold. I said, well, how do you help children if you can't get the money to them before they're 18? And, and the end result was you can't. You have to wait until they're 18. And so I begged and borrowed and uh, adapted the notion of a futures account, which is based on the principle that every year a child is alive, you would deposit $3,000 into a futures account. At age 18, the child would have access to the futures account, the adult now, um, or chronological adult would have access to a futures account. And you could use the money for two things, not surprisingly, based on the GI Bill, access to higher education, doesn't have to be a university, just post-secondary education, and or you could use the money for housing. It would accumulate to about $54,000 a year, which not coincidentally is what it would cost you for one year at Penn or four years at a state-supported institution. And $54,000, interestingly enough, is 20%, a little bit more than 20% of the median selling price of a house. Uh, in the United States. So it's the new GI Bill for American children in 2012. It is not means tested. Everybody gets it. Um, it can be used for two things and it would do two things I think that are important. One, although I can't help children from 0 to 18, 
I can at least reset the game at age 18. It's, it's a restart. So.